we'll get started. It's a quarter after. Um, did anyone not sign this from the first day? Was it, were you all here? Yeah, okay. Mm. <coughs> we're not talking about a chapter in the book today. We're talking about two subjects. One is uh, about a book that was written by Thomas Friedman <coughs> called The World is Flat. And he wrote this in 2005. And then uh, I'm using a slide set that was created by somebody else because it's, <coughs> it's a nice summary of the, of the points in the book. And then I will also discuss a review of the book, which talks about each of the points so that you don't actually have to read the whole book. Um, <coughs> I don't know if it's available online. You might have to purchase it if you wanted to see the original, but the, I put the review on the web page. So you have the review and you have the notes here on the web page. Okay. So um, the book The World is Flat is about how <coughs> the economy of the world has uh, is now on a more uh, level playing field. It's become flat because before there maybe was greater advantages for, uh, for example, for the Western world, Europe and the United States, in that they had a lead in technologies and, and uh, in the development of their economies. But that the, with uh, the development of technologies today, it has created a more level playing field. And the author of the book, um, <coughs> Thomas Friedman, he first recognized this idea that the world is flat when he was on a, a visit in Bang Bangalore in India. And he was playing golf. And he saw a bunch of big uh, global companies on the side of the field, like IBM and some other companies. <coughs> and he realized that and there was sort of um, the uh, fencing tee was, I don't know if it was, um, uh, it was like another uh, 3M or something like that. And so he recognized all of these names uh, from the Western world. And here he was in some exotic place. And they had the same names available to them. <coughs> so yeah, he says, um, um, uh, he says, I aim either at Microsoft or IBM. I was standing on the first tee of the golf club, and then he noticed that uh, uh, there was HP and Texas Instrument buildings that were being built, and that the golf tee markers were S. S. Pepson, and that the caddy was wearing a 3M hat, and that there was an advertisement for pizza on the billboard, and he um, <coughs> realized that uh, the world had become very globalized. <coughs> and uh, the person playing with him said that, um, or he said that the playing field is being leveled. There's a massive investment in technology, uh, broadband connectivity around the world, coupled with PCs uh, becoming cheap. And there is an explosion of software, email, and search engines like Google. So he uh, was attributing uh, this to the technology that had arisen. <coughs> we have uh, software that can chop up pieces of work and send one part to Boston and another part to India and another part to Beijing. And <coughs> in 2000, uh, these came together, creating a platform of intellectual work, intellectual capital, and it could be delivered from anywhere. So um, even though these two people were sitting in different places, they were able to uh, share and, um, not only communication, but collaborate and work together. So the planning of the world means that we are now connecting all of the knowledge centers of the world together into a single global network, which is, um, could be used for good or bad, but it may uh, usher in a new era of prosperity and innovation. 
<coughs> so what I want to do is also <coughs> just uh, point out what were these uh, different phases of uh, globalization and also the 10 forces that were involved in flattening the world. He says in the um, <coughs> first phase, eight, in 1492 to 1820, uh, there was exploration and colonization, and the countries uh, were beginning to trade, and therefore their economies were becoming more uh, connected to each other, and that this globalization shrank the world from a very large world to a medium-sized world. And then in <coughs> 1820 uh, to 2000, this is a, a large span of industrialization. Um, we said that there was more uh, collaboration internationally between companies. Uh, different uh, companies provided different um, sources of products, for example, and that uh, the companies, in order to become uh, <coughs> truly successful, they needed to be uh, come global in order to survive. And so in the first half, um, this became possible because of uh, physical infrastructures like railroads and uh, transportation systems that reduce the cost of manufacturing. And um, also, at the, in the later parts, uh, near 2000, there was the uh, communication infrastructure, the telecommunications infrastructure that allowed for information exchange. <coughs> from 2000 to the present, oh, and they, oh, this also, he said, shrank the world from medium size to small size. And then in the last phase from 2000 to the present, he says that individuals and groups were able to truly work together and that uh, this drives um, a diverse groups, this is driven by diverse groups of all nationalities so that it doesn't matter where you are uh, in, in order to collaborate, you can still collaborate. And this type of globalization has shrunk the world from small to a tiny size. Um, examples of um, truly global uh, companies are JetBlue Reservation System. <coughs> it allows um, anyone that wants to take part in this, retirees and housewives, to uh, take airplane reservations from their home. So it doesn't. It empowers the individual to be able to make use of a global system. <coughs> the McDonald's call center uh, drive through customers across the country give their orders to a uh, worker in Colorado Springs. So um, I don't know this example, this, where they're coming from. <coughs> it's probably discussed in the book itself. But it allows um, people to call in orders, probably doing it online. Uh, Indian technicians and engineers can write um, software and support companies in other countries and in workers and technicians uh, in one country can support workers in another country. So they're talking about uh, being able to <coughs> speak the other languages also. Okay, so um, the 10 forces. Uh, I'm going to write some of this stuff up here as well, but um, the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, and since then there has been a shift in power uh, to the free market, and there's been an outbreak of um, uh, this uh, type of, there was an outbreak of this type of independence in other areas in the Eastern Bloc countries. <coughs> so. The factors of um, the world finder number one was that there was um, <coughs> uh, an emphasis towards uh, free market. So free market economies are emerging. <coughs> And what <coughs> this means is that the uh, consumer decides the prices. So 
So the consumers decide the prices of goods and uh, that it's no longer central governments that are running uh, the businesses. So you have a, uh, eventually this has an impact on, on the privatization of some of the government industries like telecommunications and postal services and things like that. Um, and this also leads to the world to see itself as one uh, giant economy. Um, in addition, uh, to this, which uh, was the Berlin Wall. You also had a technology uh, change, and that was at, um, in May 1990. You have uh, Windows 3.0 comes out. And this had a, a lot to do with uh, the success of the uh, individual personal computer. Um, and in addition, uh, there was the introduction of authoring tools. So that uh, individuals can now uh, enter the age of creativity. They can make things themselves. Okay, so this was um, the first Latin. The second one was, uh, they mentioned, is Netscape. And uh, basically it says, um, when the web went around the world and Netscape went public. So uh, this was 1995. And uh, Netscape is uh, one of the is the first browser to make use of a um, language for writing web pages called HTML. So, in addition, there was the standards HTML for writing web pages and allowing you to be able to link pages uh, with each other and share information. And other standards emerged, uh, such as uh, email standards like SMTP and POP. And then there was also file transfer standard FTP, that's file transfer protocol, and security standards like SSL. Okay. So this is, um, these are standards, agreements for how to communicate using these electronic networks. And this allowed uh, the presentation of a user-friendly interface of graphic content. So this is user-friendly. that everybody could see. And this allows for the linking and exchange of information. Of this uh, digital content. Okay. 
And then um, also when uh, Netscape went public, so Netscape as a company goes public. Um, this also was uh, among and, and with these factors in line, it contributed to dot-com companies emerging. And when the dot companies companies began to emerge, this led to a uh, growth in, in the investment of fiber optic cable. So that was all uh, well and good. And then uh, number three is um, the workflow software developed, software and standards developed to allow people to work together, created a global platform that enabled collaboration. So <coughs> they talk about here is that um, um, there was um, <coughs> Like they talked about writers from different towns being able to work on the design of a children's program. And the reason they were able to do this, again, was because of standards like SMTP and FTP and SSL that allowed people with different computing systems to communicate with each other. But in addition, uh, they also said that many people uh, maybe are and not in agreement with Microsoft's uh, business practices. However, the office software, like Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, increased their, our ability to share and coordinate our work. So, so this, <coughs> this was a, a workflow software development. I'll just put WSD. And that is things like uh, Office, It allows people on uh, various types of um, uh, systems to be able to, PCs, for example, to be able to share their work. And um, so uh, these were kind of the predecessors for the next uh, six uh, steps or seven steps that uh, allowed for um, <coughs> Uh, people to be able to work together and share their work. Okay, I have to erase this now so that you can write the notes for the next set. I realize that if I write past this point, it doesn't get on the screen, it doesn't get on the video. So um, maybe I can put some of it over here first. Okay, so number four, I'll try to write number four. So number four is open sourcing. Okay. <laughs> open sourcing means that um, end users become creators. So And this has to do with the establishment of um, um, communities uh, for development of software. And also um, things like blogging. So we have uh, software development communities. One example is uh, Apache uh, operating system or ser servers. <coughs> um, 
uh, they say that the development of this uh, type of software doesn't necessarily have bad quality. It can have very good quality. And uh, even though it's developed by a community, uh, one of the drawbacks of this is that what do you do if you need support for the software? So if you, if you develop something that, um, like that you purchase from Microsoft, then you can purchase uh, support from Microsoft. So they came up with hybrid models that would allow, even though the software itself was free, the uh, support for the software you had to, the export support you would need to pay for. So these types of open communities, you could have the, the software might be free uh, software. Plus pay support. So that was like a hybrid model. Another example of open sourcing is the blog blogs and uh, blogs communities. So they use an example of um, the news and that if uh, somebody posts something from the, the news company, they might post something that is uh, incorrect, that the community itself uh, can correct the sources or can verify the sources. So you might have like a news company or a company that reports an article. And then the public can verify sources. I guess you could say other kinds of open sourcing might be things like wiki, uh, wiki development. <coughs> OK, uh, number five is outsourcing. Outsourcing any service call center business support operations or knowledge work that can be digitized can be sourced globally. An opportunity to seek uh, the cheapest, smartest, most efficient providers. And this invigorated by the Y2K computer data crisis. They thought there was going to be a problem <coughs> with the numbers when the year changed from 1999 to 2000. The um, thing is, outsourcing uh, has, uh, <coughs> is a process that works. Uh, used to, when you have something that used to be done in-house by one company, and they get another company to do part of this job uh, that they, you normally did in-house. And one example would be like tasks like accounting is one example. And you would get some other company to do company B. There may be accounting specialist to do this for your company because you're not accounting specialist. And the reason you do this is because um, it's cheaper for your company not to be, have to become experts in accounting. And uh, companies have done this also with their computing infrastructures <coughs> rather than uh, developing a website, they might outsource and have somebody else develop the website and maintain the website for them. But one of the things, and not necessarily in this article, but in other articles, is that you, you probably, you, um, your functions that are um, common functions, commodity functions that anybody can do, it's OK to outsource those. But you probably should not outsource your strategic functions. So if you have something that differentiates yourself from another company, uh, you shouldn't outsource that to some other company. So you need to keep what, you're, you're, what makes you better than the rest, than the competitor for yourself. But um, this had become um, more proficient in the 1990s. And, uh, 
Uh, Friedman describes three major factors that contributed to India's attractiveness to the uh, industry companies in the US, the knowledge industry companies. So a lot of times they're outsourcing knowledge uh, functions. One thing might be like data entry, for example. And he says, um, in India, a huge amount of fiber optic cable was laid in India by the US companies in the 1990s, which became incredibly cheap after the dot-com bubble in 2000, giving Indians a nearly free broadband connection to the US. Number two, India's institutes of technology provided world-class education in engineering and other computer sciences and management. And then thanks, and number three, thanks to the history from the British colonies, India population is the second largest population of English speakers. So these things contributed to a sharing of jobs like uh, accounting, software development, and any type of um, knowledge functions, software development. Uh, can be done in other countries. So the main company might exist in the US, for example, and then in India they have a, a division of workers that are working on the software development and they share it with the company. Okay. And then this, the sixth one, I'll just erase this for a moment. <laughs> the sixth one is um, offshoring. And they give an example of China. And this is when a company moves its production from one country, home country, to another country. OK. Companies move the entire factory uh, operations offshore. The same product produced in the same way for cheaper labor and lower taxes invigorated by China joining the World Trade Organization. So uh, it's a way of um, uh, doing the same thing at a lower price. So you're creating more efficient manufacturing. Even though um, many um, countries or people working within a country don't like it, uh, the countries also, they also point out that uh, the result is that the individuals uh, that are the con consumers end up paying less because the company that is selling the pro goods or products is is providing the products more efficiently at a lower cost. So this is uh, it's spurred by competition and a willing and a wish to reduce the cost of production. Okay, now I have to erase this. Okay, so these are the first six. Number seven is supply chain. And supply chaining is increasing the connections between suppliers, retailers, and customers. And um, that is done uh, most effectively, as an example, by Walmart. Uh, they have a global supply chain uh, where they're aware of um, 
they have connections between their suppliers and their and their stores and uh, they have the people when they order when they purchase something online it gets entered into their system and then they know exactly how much products are in each store and where the distributions have to go and they know the suppliers uh, what it costs them to supply the products and how long it's going to take and where, it's, where the products are so they have a very um, detailed information on where things are in the supply chain and Walmart itself does not produce anything it's only a retailer so it's actually a, a big logistics company that is pulling together information and products from all over the world and they make use of the uh, production of offshoring so they get a lot of products that are actually produced in other countries like China and they pull these products uh, to their stores in various locations. So um, it says, uh, you may have seen some of Walmart's uh, distribution centers, Monmouth structures where trucks come and go all night, bringing products directly from distant manufacturing and taking out uh, products to its stores. Supply chaining is an example of flattening of the world because it's the way it levels the boundaries between customers and manufacturers, regardless of where in the world these manufacturers exist. And uh, <coughs> Walmart has been criticized for its, uh, its hiring and its um, uh, personnel policies because it doesn't always insure its workers. It provides its workers with low salaries. And this is also uh, part of their uh, strategy to keep their their costs down and to be competitive. Okay. And then um, I think there, there's some examples of this in the next few slides as well. So the example of this one, they give us Walmart. And number eight, insourcing. Insourcing is um, when you hire from another company to, to handle part of your supply chain. This is uh, connections. this is basically uh, involving the entire supply chain. Insourcing is trying to hire somebody to handle parts of your supply chain. And this is, they give the example of UPS, which is United Parcel Service. And um, these, they were saying that UPS helps a small company perform like a global company. So it does a lot of Times uh, it does the um, pickup and tracking and delivery of goods and services that have that belong to another company, and they use the example of uh, Toshiba Repair Lab. Where if you have a PC that is broken. Uh, the Tsushiba company will have the UPS people pick up the, um, or you send the parts. You send the parcel with UPS. They deliver it to the repair center, uh, gets fixed, and then gets sent back to you. Okay. 
So this is a picture of the Walmart home office and uh, a distribution center. Uh, you can see it's a um, high production facility, very large. <laughs> And then um, um, okay, these are some planning points uh, that they've included. Uh, resourcefulness versus opportunity. Uh, businesses in difficult situations or insecure in the marketplace will innovate and educate the industry. Uh, enhanced communication leads to identification of more instances to cut costs, small products and metadata and RFID tags. I think these are some of the things that uh, Walmart is using in its uh, distribution centers. So they're using microchips and uh, they're using RFID in their supply chain and um, they're looking at uh, technology for communication and for, um, and for um, educating the industry. Because when Walmart also changes their supply chain, uh, they need, then other people usually also have to follow. They've introduced RFID tags in their supply chain, and then other companies feel the pressure to also change. Mm. So <coughs> what are the implications for the US economy and position in the world? It says uh, adoption is necessary, resistance is futile, place in the business world is solidified by adoption and innovation. And that means that once Walmart makes these changes to their supply chain, the other companies feel pressure to follow, otherwise they go out of business. Uh, one competitor of Walmart was, or maybe still is, is Kmart. It used to be a local company and um, they've been basically pushed out. Other companies that Walmart is starting to push out are things like um, grocery stores. In the US, there's been uh, large grocery chains, and now Walmart has also gone into the uh, areas where the grocery stores provide a large variety of foods, and uh, now Walmart does the same. But it's not just foods, but it's across all kinds of product lines. So it's very, um, uh, it's very big giant and it's hard for small companies that only do segments to compete with that. Okay. <laughs> uh, they're showing that um, uh, the, the enormous size of these uh, retail outlets, you can see how big it is, and that people buy in bulk and grow in bulk because they buy in bulk. <laughs> but um, uh, it's, it's, uh, they're becoming success successful on volumes, on large volumes, and not necessarily on, uh, on small purchase, individual purchases. <coughs> UPS is the insourcing. Um, and uh, so UPS is not only shipping parcels, but also providing small business solutions. So they do parts of the supply chain. And here is UPS fixes laptops for companies to speed up the service day to, to one day turnaround time. And uh, this is for Toshiba. And then they also do things like take orders from Nike to fill the order from the warehouse staff by operators by, operated by UPS and shipped with UPS. So even though the product itself is developed by another company. So UPS makes big companies act small and small companies act big. And it, for example, if you're on eBay and you, um, the buyer pays through PayPal, you print the UPS label through PayPal and tracking number, and then it gets delivered to the customer and they provide the tracking for you. UPS is creating enabled platforms for anyone to take on their business globally and uh, provides funds for small businesses, uh, computers, and helps your business to grow. So it can also provide different types of solutions. They probably have different packages for different size companies. Hmm. Okay, 
so this is just more on them. Um, and they talk about additional services like tracking weather. <laughs> yeah. So it's a bit of a commercial for them. So anyway. OK, so we're up to number nine. And um, informing. And they use the example of Google. Um, Google is a um, search engine. <coughs> and it puts the uh, power for doing your own research in the hands of the individual. So it empowers the individual. Other types of, um, um, you could say, informing tools are things that connect communities. And they mention Yahoo groups, but also we have, of course, Facebook. <coughs> and these also allow individuals to participate within active groups. Ten is steroids. <clears throat> and what they mean by this is that uh, we have a, an abundance of mobile technologies <clears throat> that allows you to have access from anywhere. So you have access like um, from airports and hotel lobbies. And um, you also have uh, access <coughs> for your other existing uh, communication services like voice over IP and um, things that allow you to um, <coughs> communicate with anyone anywhere. And so you have the individual ones that are like for example, voice over IP products. And then you also have the um, content sharing products, like BitTorrent, for example. to write what's up here as an application and Skype, things like that. <coughs> so um, yeah, you have basically the ability to share things when you're on the go. So that's the steroids. <coughs> OK. Um, before we talk about the convergence of these, I think we'll take a break, and then we'll continue after the break. And then after the break, also, we will I will mention some things about the article. It doesn't matter because that's one of your assignments, the first one that's coming up. And I won't say everything about it, but um, it should help you with your assignment. Okay, so we'll take a break now. And I'll shut this off. <coughs> 